thank you all for coming out to my first conference presentation ever, just so we'd set our expectations really low. Um, so this is my first presentation at a real conference. Um, this is not the first time I've given this talk. Uh, it is the first time as, that I've given this talk as one talk. Uh, I've given it a bunch of times as two talks. Um, so that this is uh, C++ 11 in the wild, techniques from a real code base, uh, namely my former employer. Um, it will show uh, very small snippets of, uh, of the code um, in uh, ways that you can use C++ 11 um, in real concrete ways that I hope you can just take home and remember and implement. Right? A, a lot of talks tend to be about frameworks and, and big things where it's like, well, that's kind of cool, but either it's closed source or it only works on Windows or it only works on Linux or I just don't have the time to understand that. And in this talk, I'm, I'm gonna try to show you a couple of things that I think you will understand and take home and evangelize and possibly you'll say, oh, we already do that already. Um, and then it's not interesting. Um, uh, so if you saw in the uh, conference program, that this is uh, trimmed down from, from what I said in the schedule, which itself was trimmed down from what I said in my proposal to the, uh, the review committee. Um, I just, I keep expanding the sections and, and throwing things off the end. So what we're actually going to cover uh, in this hour um, is uh, two things for sure, the auto macro and make iterable. Um, and time permitting, uh, I'd like to talk about STID spaceship, which is not a real thing for those of you going to look it up on CPP reference right now, but it should be a real thing. Um, so what the auto macro is, or, or we call it auto, you can call it finally, you can call it whatever you like. Um, it runs uh, cleanup code at the end of a scope. It's basically, you've heard of it, it's on scope exit or at scope exit or scope guard, uh, but it's done in a really, really nice uh, way. Um, uh, make iterable and iterable range are basically, I've got two iterators, I want to treat them as a range. Um, if only there were a way to do this. Um, there is, but you have to write it yourself. Um, and then we're going to talk about how to basically write a stir comp for tuples. Um, if we have time. If not, that will turn into a lightning talk on Wednesday or Thursday, and, and uh, you can come to that if you want. Um, so let's talk about the uh, auto. Uh, here's the problem that we're, we're trying to solve. We have some code in our, in our normal old school code base, and it wants to mutate some state somehow, and so it's going to attempt an operation, and it's going to attempt a different operation. And then we realize uh, we're getting a lot of spam in our trace logs. Right, the, the disk is filling up because we're logging too much stuff because these operations are really spammy. We need to disable logging during these operations. So we throw a disable logging at the beginning of the function and enable logging at the end of the function. We're all happy. Problem is we forgot all our error handling. Unless, of course, you use exceptions, in which case your error handling looks like this and everyone is confused. Um, some, some good ways is we'll use exception handling. I, I don't actually want to diss them, but we don't. We make everything look like this, right? Um, so uh, this looks great, but then it's very obvious that you have a bug. If you use exception handling, you already had the bug in the previous slide. Um, the problem is that these early returns uh, return around the enable logging, and so your logging is just disabled um, for the rest of the program. Uh, this is a problem. We need some way of running our cleanup code at the end of a scope uh, without forgetting about it, uh, without having to put a, a cleanup block at the end and go to it or whatever. What we really want to write looks basically like this, right? We want to disable the logging, and then we want to make a note to ourselves, remember automatically at the end of the scope, no matter what, we need to enable logging again. Um, and then we just go and we write our code normally. We write, you know, the first operation, second operation, and we don't have to worry about that cleanup code again. Um, so this is what we want to write. Unfortunately, we can't write this, right? Actually, we can, we do. Um, we, uh, we write this, and the way that we get this is with the following macro. Uh, that this is include auto.h. Uh, it looks like this. Um, way down at the bottom here, uh, it, it, there, there's our auto macro. It's a variadic macro. It does some stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about all the stuff that it does, but I'll, I'll leave this up on the screen for a little while so you can sort of see how it works and walk yourself through it. Basically, at the very top of it, uh, we have uh, our usual on scope exit sort of class that you've seen before where its destructor does a thing and the thing that it does is determined by the lambda that it's constructed with. Um, 
then uh, we have a thing that makes a lambda given whatever arguments we pass to it. Um, we create an scope exit with that thing. Um, we have some magic with under under counter to actually get a unique name for one of these things. And then we have the thing that wraps it all up. Um, that's how it looks. And, and there's all sorts of things that we can talk about this, although I did just talk about pretty much all of them. Um, this uses all sorts of C++ 11 features and also all sorts of C++ 03 features and also all sorts of completely non-standard features that everyone in the universe supports. Um, it uses variadic macros. It uses token pasting. It uses templates. It uses lambdas. It uses counter. It uses pragma once. It uses macros, which are evil. Um, and uh, it also uses, uh, it, one thing it does not use is a std function. It does not use a std function of void void. Instead, it captures any kind of lambda uh, by reference back here. Um, so let's see, which one of these digressions did I decide to cover first? Oh yes, under under counter. Um, how, who here has used under under counter before? Who here has, knows what it does? Wow, okay, so we have a, a, a few number, a relatively few number of hands here. Um, so what this macro does, this is not standard, this is not in the C++ standard, but I can't name any compilers that don't actually support this in practice. Um, what it does is it gives you a new integer value every time you expand it. Um, so this is sort of like under under line, um, which is standard, right? uh, underscore underscore capital line underscore underscore, uh, which gives you the line number that you're currently on. Uh, yes, and um, I, don't, I forget where, if it starts at zero, it starts at one, it starts at some random number, I don't know, but it, it's generally monotonically increasing. Um, yes, it's a preprocessor feature. Um, a non-standard preprocessor feature of every compiler in the world. Um, and uh, we, we would avoid it here um, if there were a standard approach. Of course, the standard approach should be standardized counter, right? Um, line works, people boost, I think, uses falls back to line if counter does not exist. Um, problem with that is then you can't use the same macro on the same line, right? You have to put every use of the macro on a separate line, which is not a huge restriction, admittedly. Um, but in our case, you know, we're, we're generating code. We're actually generating C++ code, and we would like to be able to generate code that uses auto, because that's its main purpose, is it's convenient, right? Uh, it's convenient for machines as well as people. Um, it doesn't have a lot of boilerplate, and maybe in our machine-generated code, we want to reduce the size of it by removing all the unnecessary new lines. It's really annoying if some of those new lines happen to be necessary, because you're using under, under, under line everywhere. Um, so we use counter. Um, Another non-standard non feature, pragma once. Who here has used pragma once? Excellent, okay. You, you should all use it, in fact. Um, it is the clearest, most efficient way to make a, uh, a file idempotent. Who here knows what idempotent means? Fewer hands, all right. Um, ah, uh, pragma means uh, this file, include it once. Put it at the, at the very top of your, uh, of your header file. Like so. It's an include guard, yeah. Um, ah. Um, well, the question there is, why use an include guard, right? I mean, what, what does an include guard consist of? It's three lines, um, possibly with some blank lines before or after it and in, in the middle of it, and we can bike shed about those in our code reviews, you know. Um, you know, and then you probably have a copyright header or something. Does the include guard go above that or below that? Does it actually matter to the compiler? Does the compiler want to see the first line being this? Uh, when I take and I cut and paste this file, which of course I'm going to do, right? I'm going to have a widget.h, I want a widget2.h, I cut and paste it. Now I need to go change the, uh, the include guards macro in both places, make sure it says widget2 in both places. Maybe it's three places because the guy at the end if he put a comment to say this is the end of include guard for widget and I have to go change that one to widget2. It's so much boilerplate and so much bookkeeping associated with traditional include guards. Um, and I mean, th these are things that have uses. I mean, there, there are real uses for macros, defines, real uses for if and def and, and if and end if. They have their uses. Um, most compilers these days, all, I mean, all that I know of, will, uh, will treat these all identically. They'll, they'll recognize when you write an include guard, they, they'll have special logic that says, aha, this is an include guard. I will remember that this file is include guarded and I will not include it twice. But of course, it, it's when you use if and def define an end if, 
now you're tying that file to a particular macro, right? It, it says, this one is include guarded if widget is not defined anywhere else. But if widget is defined somewhere else, I have to remember not even to include this file once, right? So it's more complicated logic. Pragma once is very unambiguous. It says, look, I just want this to be a normal idempotent header file. By the way, this is what idempotent means. Um, right, it means you can include it twice and you get the same effect as if you included it once. This is the exact effect we want. We have a feature that does exactly what we want. It's too bad it's not standard yet. Um, but we should just use it, right? Make it the first line of your file. It kind of already looks sort of like a shebang, right? Uh, it's just a shepragma instead. Just make that the first line of every file, you're done. Um, the first line of every .h file, right? Um, all right, so um, talking about style, uh, why didn't we use std function in this? Actually, the first version of this code uh, did use std function until we came along and, and looked at what it was actually doing under the hood and said this is terrible. Um, that's right, the, the std function has a cost. Um, however, I mean, you might say, well, I mean, templates have costs, right? I mean, uh, like we're, we're making this lambda. I mean, a lambda has a cost, surely, right? Because we all, well, a, a lot of people know that lambda under the hood is really just a functor object that creates an unnamed class. That class has an operator print friend method with some code in it. It has some data members that are our captures. That sounds like a lot of bookkeeping. That sounds like it's gonna generate a lot of code. Um, and uh, it doesn't. Compilers are actually smart. I'm, we have a question, yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, you know, that, that does sound like lambdas are very expensive and maybe we just want to use this nice, simple, standard thing that just, I mean, it looks very simple. Um, it's, just a, it's just a std function. Uh, looks simple enough, but actually type erasure is pretty expensive. Um, and yes, why not std function? Right, here are some reasons. Um, so actually one of them is kind of, kind of silly, uh, which is that in order to use std function, you have to include it. You have to include functional. Uh, or something else that gives you function. I think functional is the thing. Um, and uh, that means you pull in all of functional, you pull in your type traits, and, and recursively just a, a whole chunk of the C++11 standard library. And uh, we don't really want that because uh, we're, we're not only machine generating code, we're also compiling it a whole lot. Again, a specialized use case, but we want things to be as lightweight as possible. If we can write it in one screen of code, as you just saw, with no other includes, um, that's nice. If we write it in one screen of code plus a million lines of included stuff from the standard library, that's not so nice. Um, we want to try to make things as small as possible. Um, so we want to use language features like Lambda rather than library features like std function. Um, also it uses type erasure, uh, which if you have not seen it, uses heap allocation. And if you have, by the way, how many people have seen type erasure? How many people have written type erasure? Same hands, all right. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll cover uh, how to implement that a little bit more later. Um, and uh, the third reason is that empirically, for no other reason than we wrote both ways and we looked at the generated code and the generated code is better. Right, yeah. Yes, we are going to see all of this. Uh, he's explaining some costs of, of uh, using std function and, and type erasure. Basically, type erasure does imply heap allocation in the general case. Um, there are optimizations that you can do. GCC doesn't do them. I don't know whether other implementations do do them. And really when we say GCC, I guess we mean libstd C++. Uh, and I don't think libc++, I, I mostly use libc++, and again, I don't think it does any special uh, small optimizations for std function. Um, maybe if you're just wrapping a function pointer, maybe. Um, but okay, let, let's actually look at some code. Uh, so here is some simple code. Um, this, I believe, is, is at the link that I mentioned at the very beginning where you can go spoil yourself on all of the entire presentation. Um, this is very simple code. It just says uh, we have a main function. Um, I put some if-trues there just so we have some scopes that we can talk about what to do when the scope ends. 
uh, in the first scope. Uh, we remember to put S2 at the end of the scope, and then we put S1, and then of course the scope ends. That's where we would normally put S2. Um, in the other block, uh, we remember to put S3 at the end of the scope, then we call foo. Now foo might actually throw an exception, so that's sort of like an early return. Um, we expect to see some sort of overhead associated um, with the auto in this case, because there are now two exits from the function. There's one where foo throws, and there's one where it doesn't. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the scope, we expect to see it put us three. Um, so uh, we compile this uh, using the auto.h that you just saw, that one line of code. Oh, question at the back. Yes, yeah. Um, it looks simpler in that there's no object visible to us, right? Because we hit it behind a macro. Well, this is not meant as a replacement for, you know, unique pointer, right? Um, it, it's not saying that, okay, stop using all RAI types and now use only this and, and write your destructor code in an auto every time, sure. right? If you have a... This is a replacement for the one-off ad hoc RAI types where you're saying, I need to remember to do this particular weird ad hoc cleanup. Let me go write a, a, a class this big to do it once, you know, when you could just take that code out of the destructor and stick it in an auto, you know. Uh, well, usually I don't have, well, the constructor is just the thing that I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, that's just code that well, goes right here, right? Right. right, I could have a, a logging disabler object, right, with REI. Um, so, yes, I can create a logging enabler object or a logging disabler object. And that, that's the sort of ad hoc thing I mean. If, if that's a useful case that I'm going to use 100 times or even 10 times, even five times in my program, yes, absolutely. You know, write that logging disabler object, definitely. REI is awesome. Um, but if it's just this one-off thing where, I mean, this could be, this is just, this is a, a hack where I'm saying, like, you know, I need to make a two-line change. You know, I, I need to code review it, I need to push it today. This, this, is, this is not, you know, well, guys, look, I think we need a logging disabler. Let me write this uh, header file for it, and let's figure out where to put it and what to call it. And then, you know, this is, I need to automatically do a thing at the end of a scope. Done. Right? So, I mean, that is the use case. This is not a replacement for AI at all. Right, this is not a, we use it a lot in our code base. You will see people making raw pointers and newing, you know, new T and then auto delete, auto delete P is all over the code base. But that, that is obviously a code smell that should not exist. Nobody should ever do that. Uh, they should use unique pointer, um, right. Um, but for the ad hoc code where it doesn't really make sense to create a, a, a whole new object, um, that's what we're looking for here. Um, like in this case, right, we're just, at the end of the scope, we're going to print two. It doesn't really make sense to to make an object that prints at the end of the scope. <laughs> On the other hand, I do like arguing with the audience. Um, um, and that this is one way that this will stretch into. A, the, the full hour, but uh, um, but also yes, well taken, and clearly the audience agrees. So um, uh, so here's the code that's generated uh, for this uh, this example program uh, using uh, Clang 3.4. Um, the current Clang I think is 3.5. They might even be up to 3.6 now, uh, but this is 3.4 because that's what I happen to have on my MacBook. Um, this is with O2, which is perfectly reasonable for optimizations. It generates perfect code. Perfect code. Right, not, not like, oh, there's a little bit of overhead, but this is literally the code that you would write in assembly if you needed to do that thing as efficiently as possible. And what that thing is, remember, is a main function that prints one, prints two, calls foo, and then prints three whether it throws or not. 
And that is exactly what we do here, right? The, the first, well, we have a stack frame. We can get rid of the stack frame by passing 03. Um, after the stack frame, uh, we push the address of one, we call put us. We push the address of two, we call put us. Right, auto had no overhead there. Which surprised the heck out of me the first time that I compiled this. Um, because I was figuring, you know, there's gonna be a little bit of overhead, because I'm over making these lambdas, there's templates, there's all sorts of things. But Clang is smart and it just inlines everything. I mean, it knows the body of the lambda, it knows when you call it. it you know, it, it's smart. And inlining just gets rid of everything. Um, well, you know, that's Clang, that's, that's nice new code. Let, let's look at GCC, which is older. GCC's code is shorter. Um, it, it's only shorter because it emits the stack frame. Um, you'll notice that the, the name mangling is different because this is Linux. Um, but again, perfect code. Load the address of one, call put us. Load the address of two, call put us. Call foo. Um, in both cases, we're using a table driven exception handling, which means that if foo doesn't throw, there's no overhead at all. We just go to the next line when we return, and we put us three, and then we return. If foo did happen to throw, there's a table somewhere else in the data section, RO data, from some other actual section, but it's basically RO data, that says, if a, an exception is thrown from this line, please jump to this other line. In this case, it would have the address of L3. And so if foo throws, we actually go down to L3, and we execute that code, which calls put S3 again, the first time in this code path. Um, and then at the end of it, calls unwind resume to continue unwinding the stack. Um, so this really is the perfect code that you would expect to see. Um, oh, and uh, by the way, it gives perfect code if you give it a hint. GCC is not smart enough to know that put s doesn't throw. I had to cheat there. Instead of including stidio.h, I had to tell it that it was no except. That may be true. All right, well, the, the, this was with Ubuntu, this was with GCC 4.8 and libstid C++. That's all I know. I know that I needed to, to add the, the no except to make that work. Obviously, it should work out of the box. Clang makes it work out of the box, so it, it can be done. Um, this is the std function version. Uh, this is using std function in, in the red text that we saw earlier. Um, this is terrible. This is just ridiculously bad. Um, I mean, it's got stack check guards, which I'm not even sure what those are doing in there. They're probably inlined from uh, a constructor or something. Um, it's got calls all over the place. Um, so it's actually calling out to out-of-line code. And in, in fact, if this is just an excerpt from the assembly list thing, there, there's another 700 lines of, of assembly just of std functions constructor and destructor and, and whatever else we're doing with it. I think we have to copy one at some point. There, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, it's just terrible. So how, so how is it implemented to get such bad performance? Uh, so this is where I asked who, who is implemented and who has seen type erasure and got very few hands. Um, so I actually added some slides to this last night about type erasure. Um, so here's the idea. A std function is trying to capture an arbitrary callable object. That means essentially an object of any type at all. It, it could be a function pointer, it could be a lambda, it could be some user-defined type. And of course user-defined type means any type at all. Um, so the first step is we need to make some sort of container that holds any type at all. Um, that's easy, we make a template class, right? A container of T now can hold a T. Um, and then our std function is going to hold a container of T. Um, problem there is now we, we have the same problem recursively, don't we? Well, not really, because now the thing that we're holding is not an arbitrary type, it's actually a type that we control, it's a container of T. And we can do things with those container of Ts that we can make a pointer that points to any container of T just by making it inherit from a base class. So now we have a class container base, we make container of T inherit from container base, and in our actual type erased object class, uh, we have a pointer to container base, and whenever we want to hold an object of an arbitrary type X, we make a new container of X, and we, we save it. Um, if we want to do anything with that X, we need to expose those through virtual methods of the, uh, the container of T. Um, how many people did that make sense to? That's more hands than the type erasure hands, so that, that's good. This is what it looks like in one screen. Um, so uh, we, we see all the same things that I, I said earlier. Um, I'm not claiming that this works for every type. Um, also, we're, we're completely ignoring the whole thing that function makes a function signature. 
Um, I'm just assuming that it's void of void. Um, and I sort of fudged the, uh, the uh, construction here that a real std function would be constructed from all sorts of different things. They'd probably be some R value references involved. Uh, I just pass everything by value and move it around. Um, but that's basically the, the, the thing here. And, and you can see the performance issues uh, that we saw in the assembly code, right? Um, namely, virtual dispatch. Right? Vir uh, calling a virtual method has a runtime cost. Uh, memory allocation, new and delete, right? Every time we create a std function, even if it's on the stack, we're doing heap allocation. Um, uh, if, si if the size of lambda is small, we could do some sort of small string optimization where we actually put it into the, the space on the stack. Um, that's the optimization that uh, libs did C++ doesn't do. Um, and neither does libc++ as far as I know. Um, also at one point, we actually, we were given this lambda, we actually have to move it onto our new container of T on the stack. Um, or sorry, on the heap. We have to move it from wherever it is to on the heap. That means a move construction. Um, move constructing, well, you know, was introduced in C++ 11. It is cheaper than copy constructing in general. Uh, but it's still more expensive than not doing anything. Right? The, the cheapest thing that you can possibly do in C++ is nothing. Um, and what we're doing here is not nothing, therefore it is more expensive than it needs to be. Um, also, the last thing which, again, surprised me a little bit when I realized it, uh, was that in one place here, maybe two places, we mentioned std move. Um, which you think of as, I mean, all it's doing is casting to an R value reference. It, it has no effect on the value. It's purely a type system feature. Um, but in order to get it, you, you need to include utility. And uh, what it actually does, it doesn't just cast to T ref ref. Um, that's what std forward does. What it does is it casts to std remove reference of T ref ref. And then std remove reference has to be instantiated for whatever T it is that you're moving. Um, and so you end up with a whole bunch of instantiations of remove reference floating around. Um, and so that contributes to your compile time and possibly to your length time. I'm not saying you shouldn't use stdmove. Of course you should use stdmove. Um, but it's interesting that when we're trying to write the smallest possible thing that gets the job done, we realize, wait a minute, every time someone instantiates this thing, they're also instantiating a whole ton of, of type traits. Um, okay, so People were asking, why don't you just do something different? Um, yeah, that, that's always what they ask when you come up with something, right? It's, why don't you just do something different? Um, there are some different things out there that all solve the same problem, uh, dating all the way back to uh, Alexandrescu, um, Andre Alexandrescu and Petru Marginon. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, December 2000, C++ 98, even before the O3 standard. Um, they wrote an, art, an article in Dr. Dobbs titled Change the Way You Write Exception Safe Code Forever, um, where they introduced this idea of a scope guard object where you give it something to run in the destructor, um, and then it does that. Um, of course, in their day, they did not have lambdas, so you, they said, well, it can take a function pointer or it can take a method. Um, and this is the sort of uh, syntax that they would use, for our example, way back at the beginning of, at the end of the scope, I need to re-enable logging. Um, this is made easy by the fact that the code to run at the end of the scope was just, you know, state enable logging. If it had been something more complicated with control flow, um, it would have had to be encapsulated in, in a function before you could use it. And in fact, I think, yes, right, can't run arbitrary code unless it's wrapped in the function. Can't write your cleanup code inline. Um, and your cleanup code can't refer to local variables because you can't capture anything. Um, auto captures everything from your local scope by reference, so you can even modify it if you want. Because there's nothing wrong with that. Um, except insofar as there's something wrong with mutable state. Right? Um, but that was the whole point of the example, wasn't the mutate state. Um, here's boost. Boost has a thing called scope exit. It suggests that you write that top thing, that's three lines. Um, they probably don't have to be on three lines, but if you write it on one line, that's even worse. Um, very similar to auto, actually, uh, in that you don't see lambdas anywhere. But it's so much boilerplate. Look at that, boost scope exit, and then you have to list out your captures explicitly in that case. And, uh, they give a C++ 11 alternative with a lambda, where again you have to see the lambda explicitly, and you have to come up with a unique name, which we use under under counter for. But again, coming up with unique names, um, it's, it's not hard, but it's harder than it needs to be. Because the easiest thing to do is nothing. If you're not doing nothing, you're doing too much. Um, 
Uh, here's Google Scope Exit. Uh, this, this is an example taken straight from their documentation, by the way. Um, I am amazed that they would write this in their documentation and not kill themselves. Uh, they have I in parentheses, and then they have scope exit template var T, because they have to capture that T, and somehow that's different. Somehow T is a different sort of entity from I and X. I don't really know why. It, it, yeah. Also capturing the, the this pointer is some other weird macro. Um, I don't know what they're doing, but it, it's, it's weird. Um, and again, you have to explicitly name everything you capture. Uh, this is something on, on Google code. Uh, it's called scope exit. Um, I believe it's from Google. Uh, if it's not, my apologies to Google. <laughs> um, did I give a uh, did I give a link back here? I did not. Um, but I'm I'm hoping that if you Google Google scope exit, <laughs> you'll find out where it comes from. It may be someone else entirely, in which case my apologies to whoever it is and, and my insults to whoever actually did it. Um, because we've seen, right? Like, why would you write this, right? Like, there's, there's arguments for, okay, let's get rid of all of this, let's just use a BREI we're familiar with of, of writing these ad hoc classes. Okay, we all understand that. But why would you choose to write this? <laughs> um, and so here it is one more time. This, this is the thing that you should memorize and take home with you and evangelize. Um, of, you know, remember how to write that thing that captures lambda and calls it in the destructor. Um, remember how to paste things together and use counter to uh, create one of these things and wrap it all up in a nice short name, um, which I almost for this presentation called finally instead of auto, but that's also slightly misleading. Um, and, uh, and yes, new, new developers come on board and they write something and we say, don't you know auto solves that? And they say, I've read every C++ book on auto and I don't see how that solves my problem. And we have to tell them, no, no, capital A auto, go look it up, it's in the tether file. So auto has its own problems, uh, but whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that concludes that first, oh no, it doesn't quite. Uh, let me cover this and then I'll get to you. Um, uh, so this is one more application of, of how to use this sort of thing, more macros. We happen to like macros a certain degree. I, I personally, temperamentally, tend to like macros a certain degree. Some people hate macros. If you hate macros, don't watch this part. Um, we have a lot of code that looks like this. Um, we have a thing called a code printer. It's basically a string stream. You can print f things to it. Um, it has methods, scope and unscope, because it's made for printing code that we're going to then print out to a file. Uh, that will print curly braces and then indent everything afterward, right? It keeps track of where the indentation level is. It, but you could write this, right? Um, but it's really annoying to have to do all this scope and unscope. Um, it's very confusing to look at this code and try to figure out, okay, I need to add one line to the generated code. Where do I add it to this code? Um, and so what we actually write is we have a single macro, macro, uh, called autoscope, uh, where what it does is open a scope and then auto unscope it. Um, so now uh, you can actually organize your code um, so that the code generator resembles the code generation. Um, the, and the structure of it actually matches. And now you can see, okay, well I wanna add something in the body of the if, I know exactly where to put it because I see the body of the if you know, on my screen. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you still have a question? Uh, well, we don't use exceptions at all, so uh, the question was, uh, should you put no except on the destructor, or that you should put no except on the destructor. Um, um, also true, and, and I mean, maybe you could throw an exception out of there and it would be okay in some cases, I don't know. It, just, it seems like, you know, if, if you throw something out of there, you probably have some sort of issue anyway, but I don't know. Yes? Well then, you're, you're wanting to do something no matter how I exit the scope, right? At the end of the scope, no matter what, where your no matter what code throws. I contend that that's a bad idea anyway. Right, your cleanup code shouldn't be throwing. 
if your cleanup code is throwing, that's as bad as a destructor throwing, because in this case it is a destructor throwing, right? And the destructor should never throw. Yeah. In other words, this is a tool that makes it easy to shoot yourself in the foot and blow your whole leg off. Um, yes. Uh, if you're in the habit of aiming at your feet, yes. You know, we, we don't use exceptions, so we don't have that problem. If you do use a lot of exceptions, have a lot of functions that your newbies are going to use and just throw exceptions, yeah, you probably shouldn't be using this, but I don't know if that, that may be a code smell anyway. Yeah. Definitely nobody should be using go to error, like ever. I, I, even if you don't like macros or crazy magic or token pasting or any of the other things going on here, I think we can all agree no one should ever use go to error. Um, and if not, hold it till the end. Um, so that was chapter one. We do actually have a whole second chapter and we have about 30 minutes left if I read that sign correctly. So this is good, because this one should be fast. Um, this is about inside out containers. This is something I'm sure everyone has seen before, but I'm going to motivate the example anyway. We have, uh, we're modeling SQL tables. So we have some metadata about them represented as C++ objects. Um, uh, this is not about ODB, about, about uh, representing my schema. This is, this is about representing a table itself. So a table has columns and it has keys, right? And it has a bunch of other stuff. But for the sake of fitting on one slide, we've got columns and we've got keys. And because we wrote this code in a hurry 10 years ago. It looks like this. Um, we have just a pointer to a bunch of columns on the heap and a column count that says how many we got. And the same thing for keys. And we have some accessors because everyone knows that in C++ you should use accessor methods, right? Getters and setters. And so we have some getters for all of our different members. Every single member because who would make them public? Um, and then we... Uh, well, oh yes, why, why would we not just use std vector? Because someone's going to say, you know, we have std vector for this if you just want to allocate things on the heap. Um, but maybe we have some more complicated case where our keys are really segregated into common keys and foreign keys, and we want to iterate first the first half of the array, the second half of the array, the whole array, and we want to do this very easily. Um, and maybe we care about uh, size efficiency, um, where you'll notice that we can put two of an eight byte pointer, an eight byte pointer, a four byte quantity, a four byte quantity, instead of having to organize, I don't know, all sorts of historical legacy reasons, including weird design choices, that we might want to organize it this way. And now we have to deal with it, and so we write a whole bunch of code that looks like this, and this is terrible, right? Um, this is basically worse than uh, the sort of default um, C++03 stuff that uh, Bjarne was talking about in his uh, keynote uh, before lunch. Um, where we're not even using iterators, we're using ints and we're iterating over the, the get num columns and uh, pulling the ith element out of get columns. And we don't want to deal with that. We want to write something that looks like this. Um, this is using nice new for loop syntax, which everyone should use. Um, and I hear it's getting better at some point in the future and that you won't have to write the type anymore. Um, and uh, so we have this free function columns. It takes an MD table star and uh, gets us an iterable of the columns. It doesn't just get us the pointer to the columns, right? Because that's not good enough. It gets us a pointer and an extent in some form that can be consumed by a ranged for loop. Um, what does this look like? Looks like this, more or less. Uh, modulo, const, and, and you know, overloads for references and all sorts of things. Um, it looks like this. We, uh, we get the, the column's pointer, and we get, that's a pointer to the beginning of the array. We, we get the pointer to the end of the array, and we package those up in something we, we call make iterable, um, analogous to make pair. Um, and we do the same thing for the keys. 
um, and we return an iterable um, of that iterator type. Um, how many people does this already look familiar to? Okay, a good, uh, good number of people. Um, right, so iterable and make iterable are the concepts here. Those are the things that we need to then implement as our take home things. They look basically like this, right? An iterable is basically a pair of iterators. Uh, it's got uh, two iterators. Its constructor takes two iterators. It keeps them for you. When you call begin, you get the first one. When you call end, you get the last one. Um, and make iterable is just a factory that, that sort of hides the, the fact that you have to, the, the template type deduction, right? It hides that from you. Um, just likes to make pair and make shared and make unique. Um, make unique is coming in C++14. Um, everyone in the world has a version of this. Um, so uh, Marshall Clow has a blog post. He calls it iterator pair. Um, Alistair Meredith has a paper where he wants to call it std range. Uh, Google has a paper where they want to call it std range. Uh, Boost calls it iterator range. Um, and it's just a pair of iterators. Um, in fact, you might wonder, how much like a pair of iterators is it? Um, in the original proposal for C++11, it was actually called std pair. Um, what follows is a summary of, of a nice paper by Alistair Meredith. He's not actually in the audience, is he? No. Um, called pairs do not make good ranges. Um, spoiler alert, pairs don't make good ranges. Um, so uh, this is a bad idea to, to Basically, the, so the C++11 proposal said, we need a way of doing this. Let's say if you have a pair of two iterator types, or basically if you have a pair at all, and you call, you know, you can say pair.first to get the first one, pair.second to get the second one. Let's just call them begin and end. Pair.begin gets you the first one, pair.end gets you the second one. Um, that sounds great. Then you could just use it in a, in a for loop, and it just works. And they were gonna standardize this until they decided, well, actually, this is kind of a bad idea. Um, this is audience participation. Why is this a bad idea? I, I meant someone actually answered that. But, um, not all, infinite range, well, kind of, but you never want to write a for loop over an infinite range. I mean, that's the thing, the, the working group on, I'll, I'll cover the working group on ranges later. But basically, we have some pairs of iterators in the standard library already, and you can conceive of others, that are not ranges. You can have a pair of iterators that does not represent a range. For example, they could just be in the wrong order, right? End, comma, begin is not a range. Um, can you think of any standard algorithms? Raise your hand if you can think of a standard algorithm that deals in pairs of iterators that, that are not ranges. I see no hands. Here are three. Um, these are highly obscure, but they exist. Um, mismatch, for example, takes basically, it takes two containers. Um, and gives you the first position at which they differ. But of course, in order to do that, because the standard algorithms all deal in iterators, it has to take the beginning and end of one container, the beginning of another container, iterate over them until it finds a difference, and then it returns that pair of iterators, one into the first container and one into the second container. So it gives you a pair of iterators that aren't even into the same container, and they might even be different types. Min-max element is better and worse in that it always gives you a, a pair of iterators into the same container, the first one points the minimum element, the second one points the maximum element. If you're lucky, or unlucky, this is actually a range, but of course they could be in the other order. Or if it's a range of one element, I guess they might be the same. Um, and partition copy does something obscure, which I will skip because it is irrelevant. Um, and uh, so here's, here's the summary. Uh, the take home for inside out containers is, there it is. Um, you can make a container view of any old object, right? If I have a pointer and an extent, or two pointers, um, I can just wrap them up in a call to make iterable, and suddenly I have something with the begin and end that I can iterate over, I can pass it. Um, if Bjarne gets his way, as he again talked about in the keynote, he, you know, all the standard algorithms right now use pairs of iterators as their, or, or iterators as their core concept. He says, well, really, they should be using containers. Like, container is kind of a better concept but we don't have any way at the moment to get a container out of a pair of iterators unless you write it yourself like this. Um, uh, you can iterate over a subrange. You can have an object like table that has columns and keys and we don't have to decide which of those is table.begin and table.end and which of them is some random thing that can't be iterated. Um, just say columns and table, keys and table. Um, ranges are coming at some point. 
there is a study group. I think it might even be study group number one um, that wants to put ranges into C++ 17. Um, they have no proposal. I, I wrote this at home having no idea. I came here, I talked to Alistair Meredith and, and Marshall Clow and, and said, okay, tell me what I should write here instead. And they said, no, you got it pretty much right. Yeah, we have no idea. Um, because they, they don't want to standardize something this simple and then block something more complicated, such as infinite ranges um, or being able to compose ranges, um, you know, which are things that you can't do with this very simple thing. So this very simple thing just didn't make it into any standard ever. Um, and then we get to chapter three, STID spaceship, which I could cover. We have 15 minutes left, apparently. Um, were there any questions about, about iterable? No, all right. Um, boost iterator range, or iterator pair, what do they call it? Boost has a thing called iterator range, which I believe is, is, uh, um, is what we're talking about here. All right, so there are a lot of slides in this, but I think a lot of them go fast. Um, also here, we're no longer talking about the same code base. We're gonna talk about LLVM. This is something I saw come by on the LLVM mailing list a while back, um, where the uh, Clang is currently um, upgrading, basically, its code base piecemeal to C++ 11. Um, and one thing that they have in a lot of places is, oh, this is messy code, let's simplify this code. Um, they have a thing, a, a convenience method that sorts an array of plain old data. Um, you might say, why do they even have this? Even C++ 98 had std sort, why don't they just use std sort? And the reason that they don't use it often is because a lot of the time, something like qsort performs perfectly well and there's no reason to go through, all, again, all that template instantiation. Um, bloating your code base with different template instantiations for something that can be solved with QSort. Um, so they write QSort, um, they call QSort, uh, and they pass it their start and end iterators and a comparison function. Um, very nice, then all you need to do is write the comparison function that you would pass to this array pod sort method. Um, so uh, someone recently, not that recently anymore, but a while back went through, found all these comparators and turned them into lambdas um, and then realized that didn't work with MSVC or some old GCC or something and referred it all. But in the meantime, you got to see every comparator in the system. And I looked at some of them and they, they come in all sorts of flavors for comparing two items. Um, this is a pretty common idiom, by the way, of, of uh, doing this kind of comparison. You all, you all know QSort takes a comparator that returns negative zero or positive, um, depending on whether the item is less than, equal to, or greater than, right? And that's pretty common because in C we have stircomp. Everyone knows stircomp, it behaves that way. And then qsort and bsearch expect comparators that behave that way. Unfortunately, you can't pass stircomp to qsort uh, because when you're qsorting arrays of char star, you really need something that takes char star star, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so C has a bunch of these functions that, that return this negative one, zero, positive one, or negative something, zero, positive something, um, to tell you given two things, compare them. Not is one less than the other, not, not any sort of Boolean predicate, but just compare them and tell me the answer. Um, even C++ has some of these. std string has a compare method, which behaves like stircomp. Um, how many people here know that that method existed? Who string compare? Fair number. It is documented. Uh, <laughs> uh, but do people read documentation? No. Um, but we have a, all, a whole variety of these comparators, right? Um, just in, in LLVM alone, not to mention all these, this other code, um, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to write this fundamental operation of, I would like to compare two things, please, tell me the answer. Um, and it's not really clear which of them to write. And, and again, the, this kind of goes back to the, uh, what I talked about with Pragma once, where when there's a bunch of different ways to write things and a bunch of different ways to get them wrong, um, that's suboptimal. We would, we would like to avoid the, the bike shedding on the, the style of each of these and uh, just say, like, I wish there was just a simple way to do this, right? Just one nice way to say, I have two objects, I would like to compare them, please give me the answer. Uh, this is a solved problem, right? Uh, it, people who have used, say, Perl or any of the other languages that stole it from Perl know that it's called the spaceship operator. It looks like that because it looks like a little spaceship, 
right? It's like Darth Vader's ship. Um, and uh, this is what it means. Uh, uh, this is not a talk about operator overloading. I know as soon as you saw this slide, you were like, oh my god, he's going to somehow overload the, the, the I don't even know, right? Uh, no, the, uh, I don't think that's actually possible. Uh, we can just spell it STID spaceship. I would be satisfied with a STID spaceship if it actually made it ever into the standard. I assume it would be called STID compare because it's boring. Um, but if it were called STID spaceship, you know, STID dinosaur, you know, that's, you know STID robot, you know, those are all good names. Um, so uh, this is how LLVM uh, first decided. So this, this came in, in a discussion on the mailing list that someone said, uh, oh, okay, well, we, we can actually uh, just write a, a generic comparator for any type T if we just write it like this. Uh, we'll pass in two uh, void stars that really point to Ts. We'll reinterpret cast them back to Ts, and then we'll compare them. If P1 is less, we'll return minus 1. If P2 is less, we'll return positive 1. Otherwise, we'll return 0. Done and done. And then the bike shedding starts, right? Because what's, what's, so what's the problem with this? What's that? We're going to assume that people use it correctly. We're going to assume that they are, in fact, type T. Stid sort? Because we're only introducing one template. We're not introducing intro sort and heap sort and blah, 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 blah. Um, now, the, the real problem here is inefficiency, says the guy on the mailing list, um, because um, what we're actually doing here is two comparisons, right? Well, comparisons are cheap, right, if you're comparing ints or whatever. But the thing is, we're not, right? We're comparing arbitrary types. Um, so what if T is std tuple, right? What if it's a tuple of a million items or n items in general? Here, here's how tuple comparison is implemented. This is not actually that important. Uh, so I am going to skip it and move on. Um, uh, but basically, whenever you compare a tuple, you have to compare them lexicographic order. That means compare the first ones. If they're different, then you're done. Otherwise, go on to the second one. If they're the same, go on to the third one. If they're the same, go on to the fourth one. Until you get all the way down to the end and you compared all n items and they're all equal, then you can say for sure, it is not less than. Okay, well, is the other one less than it? All right, well, go all the way down, right? Um, which is the reason that things like uh, std string, which is basically a vector, provide a, a separate compare method so that you don't have to do this. Um, tuple. As far as I am aware, and hopefully I'm not wrong because my presentation is based on this, does not have a compare method. Um, but really, like, so what, right? We don't actually have a bunch of tuples, and we don't actually compare them that long. Who compares tuples? Um, unfortunately, lots of people, at least a while back, have been saying, you know, C++11 makes it really easy to create tuples and then compare them. Um, we want to use things like this, right? We, we want to say, I have a class, and I know how to compare it. And how I compare it is just, really, it's just item-wise, by some ordering of, of the members, right? I'm going to compare their A's, and then I'm going to compare their B's, and then I'm going to compare their C's, and then I'm going to compare their D's. It might not be lexically as they're written in the class. It might be in some other order. But that's, that's basically how we compare a lot of things, right? Compare it first by last name, then by first name, then by middle name, then by date of birth, you know, in, until you figure out what the answer is. Um, and you normally would have to write out all that boilerplate, right? If, last name, less than, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but C++11 makes it nice and easy. Um, actually, this is C++14 because the auto there doesn't actually have an arrow and then telling you what type it returns. Um, that's the only reason that you couldn't write this today. Um, well, I mean, you could write this today. You just have to compile in C++14 mode. Um, and uh, so this is really what we want to write. We want to tie everything up in a tuple of references. By the way, std tie. Hands, who's seen std tie? All right, who's seen std make tuple? More hands. All right, std make tuple makes a tuple. It makes copies of all the things you pass to it, and it returns you a tuple of them. Std tie makes a tuple of references. It takes references to things you pass to it and returns a tuple of references. This is, for most purposes, indistinguishable from a tuple of the actual things, but it's extremely cheap because you're just taking references to them and it all gets inlined and there's actually no overhead at all. Um, I haven't actually profiled that. There might be overhead to it, but I think there's no overhead at all. Um, 
And so this is the idiom that we want to write. If we just want to compare two items of type my class where it's A, then B, then C, then D, we just tie everything up in a tuple, compare the, this one tuple to that guy's other tuple, and then that's the answer. Uh, the problem is that then uh, to do the erase pod sort comparator, that requires comparing a tuple once for less than, and then again for less than. That's disastrously inefficient because it does twice as many comparisons as necessary. Um, so, uh, how, yeah, oh yeah, how to implement it, right. By the way, I've got five minutes left. This will go pretty fast. I will probably go over and take questions. Um, so uh, this is the easy part, right? This is the for any type. Uh, you just do the, the obvious thing. Uh, and then we're going to specialize this template for uh, tuples. Um, oh yeah, really, really, if we're putting this in a library, we need to put underscores in front of everything. And we need to make it complex. For, and we need to do all sorts of things. But you get the idea. Um, Oh, and we need one more. There's one more complication, one more little wrinkle is that std string also needs its own little uh, overload where it's going to uh, use the compare method because it wouldn't be properly implemented if it didn't use the most efficient me means possible for that. And yeah, again, we really mean this, but we'll skip over that. Um, here's the hard part. Um, and I could explain this, but I'm wondering if people care. Um, if you can read this, you probably already know what it says. Um, if you can't read this, you probably don't care what it says. Um, yeah, I'll explain it anyway. Um, so we have a, a constant expert function. It's called spaceship. It's a, uh, it's, uh, a overload specialization. Looks more like a specialization. Um, uh, for tuples. I'm sorry, it is actually an overload. Um, and uh, we're just going to static assert that the two tuples that you're passing into Spaceship have the same size. They might actually be different types, because I don't know, maybe you, you want to do something weird. You've got one of longs and one of ints, and you still want to compare them anyway. Uh, we'll let you do that, but they better be of the same size, right? Um, I guess we could make up some semantics, but we'll say they have to be the same size, and we'll just static assert it. We could use something like enable if, if we hated our users and we wanted to make the error messages as incomprehensible as possible. Um, but if we want a nice error message, we'll use static assert, and if they misuse it, their program's gonna not work anyway. Um, and then, uh, then we call this function, tuple spaceship, and we pass it the size of the, the, uh, the tuples that we've got as a template parameter. Um, I'm sorry, that is not a function, that is a type. That is a type constructor, and it has an operator paren paren because I like to make things unreadable. And the operator friend friend takes the two arguments. Um, what it will do is compare every element of the tuple all the way up to the IP element and give us an answer for that. How do we do that? Well, we compare the IP minus one elements at the front. And if that gave us an answer, awesome, we're done. Otherwise, get the IP minus, minus one element and compare that recursively using spaceship because it might be std string or something. Um, let's see. And we have a base case. The base case is tuple spaceship of a zero element tuple that it were. Um, yes. However, this is recursion in the type system rather than at runtime, right? Um, so uh, it mostly collapses down. It collapses down very expensively and slowly uh, in the compiler. Um, but at runtime, it, if we're lucky, if we don't have debug mode on. Um, so yeah, there is actually another way to write this, actually. Um, this is a, an excellent, excellent talk. Um, actually, I haven't seen the talk, so I'll just say it's excellent, excellent slides uh, that everyone in this room, if you care about this stuff, if, if you're trying to understand this and you get it, um, you need to see, uh, I forget his first name, something they own, uh, has this up on GitHub with, with also very, very nice slides um, of just really simple ways of doing meta pro template metaprogramming really efficiently in sort of ways sort of like this. Uh, this is not one of his examples, but this is how I imagine it might, uh, it might get written. Um, in this case, what we do is we allow um, the, uh, um, what do I want to say, parameter packs. Uh, to do our work for us. Uh, we use parameter pack expansion. So we don't have recursion with the base case. We have iteration. Um, 
We want to do something for the zeroth element, the first element, the second element, the third element, all the way up to the nth element. How do we do this? Well, we just need to get a parameter pack that consists of zero through n, and then do that thing dot 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 for every uh, uh, item in the, uh, in the parameter pack from zero to n. How do you do things in order in C++11? You use an initializer list. Initializer lists are comma-separated things that respect parameter pack expansion, and most critically, happen in order from left to right, top to bottom. Uh, this is not true of function argument lists or a lot of other cases where you might want to use it, but it is true by the standard for initializer lists. Um, I'm being told the session is over, but this is, I think, one of the last slides, so I'm gonna take a few questions anyway if there are. I tried benchmarking these. The, the code for benchmarking them is on the, uh, the uh, C, uh, CMU, CPP, uh, CPPCon. Uh, URL at the, the beginning of the talk. Um, so if someone wants to benchmark it for somewhere other than Clang 3.4 on Mac OS X, go for it. Um, and let me know the answers. Anyway, that's just another way that you can uh, implement that. And I think, oh yeah, yeah, then you should use Sid, Sid Spaceship everywhere. Uh, um, if someone writes it up, uh, do, you, do you know anybody on the standards committee? <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, I believe that that is unfair, and it should be in the uh, in the standard, and possibly in a future standard. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, yes. That was a somewhat tongue-in-cheek. Uh, <laughs> Uh, are there any questions about any of the parts of the, the talk here? Yes. Uh, I just had uh, one additional comment about when you add exceptions and you use auto. Um, in your very first example of using auto, you had uh, an action uh, logging uh, was disabled and then auto enabled it. Uh, if you use standard function, even though you don't, because you don't care about the performance problems, don't because uh, that construction can fail and you will never re-enable logging. That's true, constructing a std function because it uses heap allocation yes. could presumably throw bad alloc yes. or something. Yeah. If malloc fails, you should just exit your program. Um, in most cases, yes. Yeah, I mean, well, bad alloc is provided for some reason. So someone might think that, well, we ought to try to handle it. But yeah, I mean, I would agree that in general you, you can't do anything about it. And really, I mean, if you're on Linux, um, you know, malloc is never going to return null. It's always going to give you a chunk of memory. Even if memory is full, it's going to say, eh, you know, I can get it from somewhere at some point. And if you actually run out of memory, what happens is the OS kills you. You don't get a choice. That's assuming that you are the sysadmin of the computers on which your program is running. Sometimes that's not true, though. Yes? So I actually work on a domain where we, we never want to try and handle out of memory. But I need to stand up for those people who do handle out of memory, because I have done it in the past. And there are definitely cases, let's say you're working on a graphics editor, and you allocate an enormous image, the user requests a billion by billion image. You will run out of memory, and you better not crash, because they're going to lose all their data, and they're going to be angry with you. And, and the, the other point in that area is that the one time when Linux or Windows uh, will definitely say, hey, you're out of memory, is if you're a 32-bit process on a 64-bit OS. Technically, you're out of address space, but they will have no choice but to return zero because there are no other pointers that they, they can return. This is definitely one that we hit is uh, running out of address space. Not really relevant to the talk, though. <laughs>